Right, okay, so my title is The Kitchen is the Key to Victory, Women, Food and the Great War. And what I want to do is to start with a story I found in a Walsall newspaper yesterday. In February 1918, the paper reported the suicide of a 26-year-old miner's wife under the heading, Worried About Food. Ellen Causa had left home on Thursday evening to go to Tamworth Dairy for some bottled milk. She did not return. It turned out the dairy shop was closed on Thursday night. On Sunday, her body was found in the canal. At the inquest, her husband said his wife had been troubled because she could not get as much food as she wanted. They were on perfectly good terms and he had told her not to worry and not to stand in queues as he would put up with anything. He had noticed her getting thin and a little nervous and he had never heard her threaten her life. When she was taken from the canal, only the ration cards were found in her pockets. The coroner said there was no question as to the respectability and good character of the man and the woman. He thought there was very little evidence to warrant the jury saying the woman was of unsound mind. Well, you might think that's not a very cheerful place to start. But what I want to do today is to talk about the wider context for this sad story, particularly why food was such an important issue for women in the Great War. So in May 1917, Stockport Food Economy Committee had 84 meetings over one week in the town. Their purpose was, they said, to get it home to the masses that there is a real danger of our food supplies giving out unless the utmost economy in its use is practised. The week's campaign culminated in an address by Maud Pember Reeves, Director of Women's Services at the Ministry of Food. She said, if there was any question that would be settled by the people, it was the food question, because they all had to have it. We had got the enemy beaten if we kept a stiff upper lip and went ahead and did right with the food. She then went on, this was largely a woman's question. The war had turned into the hands of women and it was for the women to do the trick. It is now their job if they choose to do it. They could confound the Prussians. So this was why the kitchen is the key to victory, as this World War I poster urged. As was recognised at the time in this new kind of warfare, what was called total war, food was a weapon of war. And it was a weapon wielded by women, which might even have the capacity to empower some women. So let me just explain the context very briefly by referring to another World War I poster. So, a woman cutting bread for her daughter uh, at a domestic table in the background, the shadow of uh, a boat, uh, a ship, and a U-boat. You can read it. So, essentially, economic blockade was used in World War I for the first time by nations. The purpose was to starve out the enemy, particularly civilians, as part of a new total war which involved everyone the military and civilians, men and women, the young and the old. And its purpose was to undermine civilian morale. The thinking was that hunger would drive the population to demand an end to the war. In turn, this would then undermine military morale. Soldiers were fighting to defend their homes and families, and if they knew they were suffering at home, they might mutiny or desert. And if economic blockade worked, they too would be hungry and ill-equipped and thus less effective soldiers. Moreover, as an island, Britain was particularly vulnerable to economic blockade and to the new German U-boat, the submarine, which was particularly effective at sinking merchant shipping, bringing food as well as military supplies to British ports. So in order to conduct a total war, Britain had to organise itself to feed an army overseas, in France, in Belgium, in the Middle East and so on, 
To sustain a healthy civilian population to maximise war production to equip that army, while at the same time maintaining the support of the people. So all of those things had to be done. Otherwise, there might be food queues, riots and worse. In 1917, food riots sparked the Russian Revolution, brought down the Tsarist regime and took Russia out of the war. The British government couldn't afford for that to happen here. It was clear that the war front could not succeed without a successful home front. In terms of food, this posed a real challenge. And there was a number of reasons for this. It was because, first of all, because of the importance of imported food in 1914. In 1914, Britain produced only a fifth of the wheat, two-fifths of the butter and cheese, three-fifths of the meat and bacon, and none of the sugar it required. The second issue was the rising cost of living. Ordinary people spent 60% of their income on food. And by the middle of 1917, the average price of food was double that of 1914. So you can see there's a real problem. And then finally, the distribution of scarce goods. With the effect of fuel shortages and the need for transport, whether railways or shipping, to be used to transport military uh, personnel and goods, that affected the distribution of what scarce uh, food there was. Now, despite the current media focus on the First World War cent centenary, of which this event is, of course, a part, there remains very little, I think, real sense of how significant food was to the progress of the war as a whole, and how food shortages and the different responses to them, and by that I mean individually, collectively in homes, streets and neighbourhoods, and by the local and national state, how all of those were experienced in everyday life and significantly affected both civilian and army morale. Focusing on food allows us to see how the home front was both different to and inextricably linked to the war front. How food was used from the outset as a weapon of war by all sides, I'm talking about Britain, but I could just as well be talking about any of the other belligerent nations, and how that weapon was refined and deployed in different ways over each successive year of the war, and how everyday life on the home front was experienced differently, depending on the date in the war, but also where you lived whether you lived in a city, a town, or a village, as well as your age, your gender, and particularly your class. For everyone, the First World War brought food, its availability, its distribution, its price, and its quality, rocketing up the political agenda. However, it's important to recognise that food was traditionally seen as a woman's concern. She had the principal responsibility in most households for translating the family's income into meals on the table. During the war, the context for this daily task was one of food shortages, unequal distribution of food and fuel, long food queues and even hunger, which affected the home fronts of all combatant nations. Now, gender was central to the way in which everyday life was affected by the war. The demands of the home front meant mundane aspects of daily life, which had been seen as domestic matters, became now a public and state concern. And this had many implications for women. Their invisible domestic work could no longer be overlooked. Indeed, their labours were crucial to winning, or at least not losing, the war. In Britain, those responsible for food control felt that, quote, the food question was largely a domestic one upon which the views of women were entitled to full expression. It was increasingly recognised by the public and politicians alike that accepted daily practices in relation to shopping for necessities, the cooking and sharing of food within families and the management of household resources were no longer private matters. 
as the Win the War Cookery book, I'm sure you've become familiar with this, published in 1917, had it, every meal you serve is now literally a battle. And the language of war penetrated that, the private space of the home, and particularly women's domain, the kitchen. What food was eaten? Who got the lion's share? How well that food was cooked? and how much was wasted had until that point been largely private choices. What was new in wartime was the idea that the state could at first advise and then directly interfere in private decisions within respectable households across the classes. However, what was not questioned, indeed what was robustly shored up, was the sexual division of labour. Whatever else the war economy demanded of her, a woman's principal task was to keep the household going. This included domestic work undertaken outside the home, particularly the acquisition of food through any means necessary. Now in Britain, from the outset of hostilities, there were widespread calls to nationalise the food supply. So for the government to take over the food supply. Yet for two years, the government paid practically no attention, as this cartoon has it. Uh, usually they talk about doing your bit in wartime. This cartoon in Punch says undoing their bit. A queue of conscientious disgorgers patriotically evading prosecution. Because the government believed that the maintenance, hello, of a free market would meet the country's requirements. However, the situation kept deteriorating and the woman shopper bore the brunt of this. By 1917, the commissioners on industrial unrest were reporting that rather than strikes, it was rising prices as well as inadequate distribution, which were sources of dangerous discontent. And the phrase was increasingly used, the evil of the food queue. The top photograph is Reading, the bottom one is St. Petersburg. And in the spring of 1917, the House of Commons was informed that the country had only three or four weeks supply of food in stock. And as a consequence, in the summer of 1917, a new initiative was taken at the local level to address the increasing tension. And with it, I want to argue, came a new possibility for articulating a woman-focused politics of food. Each local authority had to set up what was called a Food Control Committee, an FCC, with a clear duty to safeguard the interests of consumers. Indeed, each committee had to have at least one representative of labour and one woman. And what I'm interested in is the extent to which women were able to shape the actions of these local FCCs and to make a difference to the ordinary women who were trying to feed their families as the cost of living escalated and the food crisis deepened. The number, class, political affiliations and place in neighbourhood networks were all factors in the effectiveness of FCC women but so too could be the links to external pressure groups, such as local food vigilance committees. These were groups, which I'll talk about a little more later on, which sought, they said, to make the views of working class consumers more effectively heard. So was tackling waste or prosecuting hoarders more important than finding fairer means of sharing meagre resources or setting up communal kitchens. These women were part of what was really the invention of food rationing in Britain. It was formally introduced in 1918, it never existed before, so it had to be invented. And as FCC members, they oversaw its implementation in local neighbourhoods. And I want to reassess this neglected aspect of the wartime home front and consider whether the arguments and practices of women in the wartime system of food control constitute a woman-focused politics of food. <laughs> 
When local authorities set up FCCs in the summer of 1917, many were dominated by retailers, by farmers and members of the food industry. And this resulted in widespread complaints. It, it was thought to be you know, biased in favour of the food industry. Moreover, local authorities were not very imaginative when it came to selecting their one woman member. The conservative interpretation of the guidelines followed by most FCCs. You know, you had to find a woman and some of them found that rather difficult. Some chose a woman from their own ranks of the council where that was possible. There were very few women councillors uh, uh, in the First World War. So, for example, councillor Caroline Herford sat on the Manchester Food Control Committee. Others looked to their own family members. So, for example, if we look at Heathtown FCC, which is near Wolverhampton, uh, the wife of a councillor um, was the woman member. She was called Annie Beard. She was the wife of a lock manufacturer and her husband was also on the committee. Other places chose an unspecified gentlewoman, a hotel proprietrix and the wife of a gentleman farmer. The point was that none of these women could easily be mistaken for ordinary women consumers. Other food control committees found their women members by asking organised groups of women, like the Women's Cooperative Guild. An example is Enfield. In my work on Staffordshire, I found no examples of that, so I don't think there are many local examples of that happening. I'd be interested to know if others have other information on that. However, this choice, the choice on who this woman was, was dependent on the area and the political complexion of the council. Even when women's organisations were approached for nominations, there were as many which were not associated with the working classes. And the working classes, of course, are the dominant group in society, by far the largest group in society. For example, in York, there were two representatives from the philanthropic National Union of Women Workers. Uh, it's a deceptive name. Um, they're not trade union women. Uh, which in the judgment of the local trades council left the working class organisations unrepresented as far as a lady was concerned. In some cases, individual nominations of women were turned down because of the prejudices within the council. So one Labour nominee claimed that there was bias against her because her husband was a conscientious objector. In some food control committees, representation was a little more diverse. The Poplar in London Food Control Committee consisted of seven members of the council, a representative of the local cooperative society, two traders and two women. And the women were Mrs Cressel from the Poplar Food and Fuel Vigilance Committee and Miss Wintour from St Mildred's House, which was a settlement house in Millwall. She's basically a social worker. This showed that consumer groups such as local food vigilance committees could get representation and choose women as their nominees because that wasn't guaranteed. Of course, the nominating body could also obscure other affiliations. So if we look, for example, at Nellie Cressel, she's a mother of six married to a paint factory worker. She was also a member of the Workers' Suffrage Federation, formerly a member of the East London Federation of Suffragettes, and later was to become Mayor of Poplar, as some of you who are near might be able to read. A more local example, um, who I know a little less about, is Mrs Charles Adams. I'm afraid I can't even find her, so far, her forename. I, I'm sure she wasn't called Charles. Um, <laughs> And as you can probably see, she was honorary secretary of the Walsall Food Vigilance Committee. And she joined the local uh, Walsall Food Control Committee in March 1918, when two women were added to the committee. Women could also be nominated as Labour representatives, as when the Manchester Food Control Committee was expanded from 12 to 16 members by the addition of four delegates from the Manchester Trades and Labour Council, including Annot Robinson. Annot Robinson was a suffragist, a socialist and a pacifist. And there she is, and there's a little bit about her. <laughs> 
Often in the lists of the membership of food control committees, a butcher or a trade unionist might be identified, but the woman, and she's usually singular, is often specified no further. It just says the woman or a woman, suggesting that she had been appointed as an individual rather than participating as a representative. So the issue was thus about who these women were as well as their number. Local protests, and there were local protests, demanded that consumers, labour and women should form the majority of food control committees, which they said should be democratically elected rather than appointed by local authorities, and should represent the ordinary people most affected by the food shortages. Some identified the poor representation of working class women as an issue. In Wakefield, for example, the complaint was that the Food Control Committee should include at least one woman who has a knowledge from actual experience of the conditions prevailing in a Yorkshire working class household. It seemed obvious to the complainant, but not to the committee. So what did women do in relation to the work of these local food control committees? Because being selected as one of the 12 Food Control Committee members was only the tip of the iceberg. Women could be found serving on the main committee, but more likely they could be invited to be members of subcommittees where these existed, for example, on the milk supply. Throughout the period of formal local food control in Britain, which lasted from 1917 to 1920, so it goes on well beyond the end of the war, there was an issue about how women got selected onto any of the formal committees, but also whether they could actually do it, whether they could serve, because there were no wages for this work. And for example, the Manchester Food Control Committee met on Mondays at 11.15 a.m., which precluded the involvement of most of those in paid employment. Usually the women's names on food control committees and their committees are activists or publicly known women whose affiliations might be known to the committee, but who were not invited as formal representatives. And here's a, a slightly more local example. Mrs. Emily Pinder, teacher and wife of a headmaster, who was selected to serve on the Litchfield Food Control Committee and later on its profiteering committee. And when you look at the Litchfield Mercury, the local paper during the war, she and her husband's names appear often amongst the great and the good, standing on a platform on flag days and so on. But she doesn't appear to have any formal affiliations, and these are the kinds of things that I've managed to find out about her, including her name. I mean, she's just on, on the, um, in the document, she just appears as Mrs Pinder. But the business of food control wasn't just conducted in committees. There are also women to be found amongst the paid staff. Each food control committee had an executive officer, leading in some cases a sizeable body of administrative assistants and clerks. Most executive officers were men, but there were also a few women. For example, Mrs Amy Saxon in Stockport. The local paper explained this unusual appointment. She'd been at the town hall for a little over two years as secretary to the mayor and also to the town clerk. She was already skilled in the administrative work generated by the war as she had supervised the clerical staff of the local military service tribunal. However, Mrs Saxon was a rarity. When the Manchester Guardian announced honours for those who had administered the war machinery in the North West, Saxon was the only female executive officer listed. A number of male executive officers got an OBE, which I'm told is rather, um, rather more than Saxon's lower status MBE. So she was, she was not even valued as highly as them. I don't yet know what difference her gender made uh, or what she brought to the task of food control. Was she the same Mrs Saxon who presided over a Manchester and Salford district temperance unions at home for soldiers' wives, addressed by the suffragist and pacifist Charlotte Despard in 1915? It's the same name, it's in the same area, but is it the same woman? More common than women like Mrs Saxon were those who worked behind the scenes to administer food control. <laughs> 
In Bredbury and Romilly, the executive officer had two lady assistants, as they were called, who earned considerably less than him. And when he resigned in April 1919, one of them, Miss Bougier, took over, but she was not offered nor seemed to expect his male rate for the job. Working out how to operate, when to intervene, and what to prioritise in food control seems to have developed with different emphases in different places, often dependent on the personality and approach of the executive officer. So who held that job was really important. All particularly forceful personalities within the food control, its, uh, food control committee itself, or groups who were lobbying from outside. The detailed delivery depended on an army of clerks who had to be recruited, trained and develop a practice as circumstances and their food control committee demanded. Many of these workers were women. So, for example, by October 1917, i.e. before any local or compulsory rationing, Manchester Food Control Committee was employing 72 women clerks and 25 male clerks on a full-time basis and expected to employ a large number of part-time clerks, presumably women, to issue uh, the first kind of stage of rationing, which was sugar cards. There were also posts particular to food control uh, initiatives. For example, Manchester advertised for a lady superintendent for their communal kitchen, but had difficulty appointing and had to replace the occupant a number of times. Moreover, women also appear in the business of local food control committees because, uh, because of course, they were retailers. So women-led businesses are being referred to in the minutes as, as well as uh, other businesses. So, for example, um, Bredbury and Romilly sought to municipalise the milk supply in order because there were so many providers of milk, they thought they should take over it. And many of those su suppliers of milk to the, to the doorstep were women. Women were directly affected by food control from both sides of the shop counter or the market stall. So women also appear in the business of food control committees when they were prosecuted under food orders. For example, six out of the 14 prosecutions listed in Manchester Food Control Committee's minutes for the 18th of February in 1918 were women. One for selling pork at an excessive price. And it was often that sort of thing. It was how much you were selling goods for. And was it higher than the price that had been agreed? Women also appear in the business of food control committees um, through the issues that were discussed. And the examples I'm going to give you are from Manchester, but they're not peculiar to that city. So for, they asked, should women who have taken up men's work receive extra rations because of the additional physical exertion forced upon them? Should they form a local consumers council representative of the whole citizenry, including representatives from women's organisations? They lobbied the Ministry of Food, demanding that adolescent girls should have the same rations as adolescent boys. They didn't. And they discussed how to create national kitchens that met local needs without carrying the whiff of charity. These were not supposed to be soup kitchens. And whether they, they should serve takeaway food or have national restaurants like in Poplar. And how the gradual implementation of rationing would affect the take up of such amenities. National kitchens were a particularly lively issue in both Wolverhampton and Walsall, eventually resulting in opposing decisions on whether the cost outweighed the benefits that a communal or national kitchen might bring. Wolverhampton went ahead, Walsall didn't. The work of food control was under constant public scrutiny as food queues worsened and the implementation of compulsory rationing rather than relying on voluntary restraint became much more likely. As early as 1915, at a large public protest at the Empire Palace in Wolverhampton, the former suffragette and later to be the city's first woman councillor, Emma Sproson, made a threat. The government, she said, would have to exercise a very strong arm between the distributor and the consumer if they would enjoy that security which the government must possess in order to carry on the war successfully. No government could succeed in war unless the people were at the back of them when they insisted on fair dealing all round. <laughs>
There was discussion in the press, both national and local, as well as in government, of where all this discontent might lead. Riots, even revolution, just like in Russia. Manchester's Food Control Committee's executive officer told his committee at the end of December 1917, it is not the actual shortage of food that is causing unrest, but the feeling that some are getting plenty while others have to go without. Urban Food Control Committees found themselves threatened by large demonstrations of workers who downed tools and demanded fair distribution of food across the country and within local communities. In Walsall in December 1917, a public meeting demanded compulsory rationing in order to end what they called a system which compelled women to waste hours standing in queues. A local miners agent described how the tram cars were filled every morning with women and children coming into Walsall to stand in the food queues and thereby reducing the proportion of food available for townspeople. He claimed the miners were threatening to go into the queues themselves. The men now said they could have work any time. What they wanted now was food. Women also took action. So, for example, mill workers in Darwin abandoned their looms to join meat and margarine queues. Their local trades council threatened that if something wasn't done about the queues, the employer's time will be used for waiting in food lines. Yeah? So they would leave work and go and stand in the queues. As the cost and availability of food became a pressing issue, people protested in the traditional manner of demonstrations and public meetings, but also in some places by forming their own local organisations to pressurise both local and national government into action. And these were the food vigilance committees. This is, a, this is the Lewisham one, you can see some of the questions it's asking. Why should you stand in queues for food for your children? The rich and well-to-do do not do it. It is beneath their dignity. Should it, also, should it not also be beneath the dignity of the wives of the workers? And so on. Unlike the food control committees, these were ad hoc groups who could constitute themselves as they chose. And this seems to have been a real opportunity for women. Still, of course, not yet formal citizens. They took an active part as officers and members of these new neighbourhood-based groups. And one example was Mrs Adams, remember her, in Walsall. So these are some of the things that I found out, I found out about her. Food vigilance committees demanded popular control of food control. They varied across the country in their constitution and in their radicalism, but they all reflected the traditions of the neighbourhoods from which they emerged. And I think that made it quite difficult for Mrs Adams because Walsall, certainly Walsall Labour, seems to have been very, very blokey. <laughs> so... Um, if women had already organised in the area, whether as socialist, labour or suffragist women, this contributed to how women-friendly an, an FVC was. It certainly seems to have helped that the FVCs were much more self-consciously concerned to be democratic, as that constituted part of their critique of the local authorities' food control committees. And their pressure could make a difference. After protests in Wakefield, led by the FVC, the representation of women on the food committee doubled. FVCs often framed specific complaints about the limitations and even failures of food control at a local level, and they badgered food control committees to improve local performance, particularly once rationing had been made compulsory and a system had to be devised to ensure it was implemented fairly. In many ways, the FVCs are the spaces in which women, particularly unorganised women, had the most prospect of translating broad concerns about their own and their family's well-being into a more self-consciously political demand. It's also here that one finally senses an awareness that most ordinary consumers were women, who at this stage of the war now faced particular battles to provide an adequate diet for their households. For example, margarine queues of at least a thousand people, marshalled five or six abreast, were reported to be gathering from 6am in Manchester and Salford just before Christmas 1917, with one queue estimated to be a quarter of a mile long. 
Faced with these challenges, what were women able to do in the new and evolving structures of food control? Well, of course, women were far from homogenous and were usually there because they were not representative of a wider group. They were often alone or in a tiny minority on the full food control committee. On food control committee subcommittees, there might be larger numbers of women, particularly those concerned with national kitchens, if the food control committee had gone down that road. Here the focus was more on implementation than policy, but that gave some opportunity for women to make a difference and to help tailor provision to the reality of many women's daily lives. So women's presence could make a difference both symbolically, you know, they were there, and practically, they could get the kitchen put in a place that was convenient for women. Wherever women were in food control, they often acted as a conduit between local communities particularly women, experiencing the unrelenting food crisis and those who were eventually empowered to devise fairer systems of pricing and distribution. Here the issues might be keeping shops open later so that women workers could actually use their ration cards and to take care to site communal facilities, whether kitchens or restaurants, where demand was actually greatest. Food Control Committee women's pre-existing connections could be important here. This certainly applies to both Annot Robinson in Manchester and Nellie Kressel in Poplar. But as yet, we don't know enough about who these FCC women were and how their contributions affected the wartime politics of food and women's politics more generally. Their voices have rarely survived in the official record. So even when you find Food Control Committee uh, minutes, the women's voices are, are not there or they're incredibly marginal. What is already apparent is that the issue of the gendering of the politics of food in World War I and specifically of food control was, I think, not always straightforward. Yes, there were clearly all sorts of assumptions about women's connections with food in the domestic sphere. But what the war had done was to translate a private domestic matter into a public one. The language was slippery. The ungendered consumer was more often used as a term than the clearly gendered term housewife. Usually they're talking about the same person, but the language is important. And this that kind of slip was not the case in other countries, but it was the case in this country. Much of the language used was saturated with class assumptions. So the organised labour movement would speak for the working class housewife, so that's usually men speaking for women. While many of those who styled themselves as a housewife in letters to the press were clearly middle class. However, I don't think this is quite as clear cut as I once did. It depends so much on the sources, and a more complex picture is emerging when one turns from national organisations, which is still where many people look, and the professional advocates of working class women like Marion Phillips of the Women's Labour League, and the national press of whatever political complexion. If you turn away from all of those national um, sources and, and people to the local, where food control was actually devised, practised, refined and policed. I think you start to get a different story. And one of the areas where the gendering of this politics was played out was in setting priorities within food control, particularly whether communal solutions were desirable. Many of the louder national voices were resistant to communal or national kitchens, and the naming of them, of course, is significant. But they actually seem to have been popular uh, and appreciated, particularly by women workers, despite the hesitation at a national level, um, including amongst women. There were even petitions to keep them open when food control was wound up in the early 1920s. Their existence was to shape conceptions of what was possible in the new local women's politics that developed in the post-franchise era. And it was in the first generation of local women councillors, working to, as uh, the Labour woman councillor Hannah Mitchell, who some of you may have come across, saw it. She 
she described her job as to make a bridge between the women in the home and the public authority and to interpret one to the other. A very interesting job description, I think. And, and it's there that I think one can see the legacy of the wartime women's politics of food in this kind of idea. This was a politics developed in homes, streets, shops and neighbourhoods, but also in local committees and organisations where women took part in not just demanding more democratic and fairer solutions to the food crisis, but also in finding ways to make food control work for ordinary women in their own communities. Rather than the food riots of the urban housewives that shook many cities of the world in 1917 and 1918, I think it can be argued that British women built a quieter but ultimately much more resilient engagement with the political structures of Britain when they connected to the everyday lives of women through the wartime women-focused politics of food. So remember that story I told you at the beginning? Well, many women worried about food in the Great War, but thankfully few in Britain suffered to the extent of Ellen Causa. Many more were changed in small and larger ways by the wartime food crisis. And if we look carefully, and if we listen hard, we can uncover some of those daily experiences and try to map out how women, women understood them. And then we're going to begin to have a more accurate picture of the importance of the home front to this new kind of warfare and, I think, what it meant for ordinary people to describe food as a weapon of war. <laughs>